Okay. Um, right. Well, if you have a question later, ask. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, I would say the basic theme from like all or almost all of the reading for this time was um, when we retain the right of nature. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is, in what respects, and uh, this can be looked at from two different points of view. One is, in what respect the government, or part of the government of a commonwealth, uh, is still authorized by the right of nature rather than by the law of the commonwealth. And the other part is to what extent do the subjects of the commonwealth retain the right of nature? Um, I mean, we know for Hobbes, so let me... So for Hobbes, I mean, for Hobbes, the government is, government is the sovereign. And um, the answer to the question, in what respect does the sovereign retain the right of nature, is completely. <laughs> right? The sovereign is not a subject, according to Hobbes. Uh, doesn't fall under any civil law. Falls under only the law of nature. And therefore retains the right of nature. Um, and on this one, the people, the subjects, according to Hobbes, the answer is that um, we retain the right to defend ourselves against death, imprisonment, or wounds. And uh, perhaps a few other things, like the right to refuse an order that would tend to our dishonor or something like that. Um, uh, but uh, basically, that's it. Whereas, according to Locke, on the other hand, the respect in which the government retain, retains the right of nature is going to be much narrower, and the respect in which the subjects retain the right of nature is going to be broader. So, um, so there's basically two respects in which the government retains the right of nature, according to Hobbes. So one of them, at least, I mean, according to Locke, if I understand them correctly, anyway. So one of them is the case of what are called prerogatives. Um, this was a huge issue in the actual history of the English crown. What are the prerogatives of the king? Um, uh, so Locke goes into great detail on it, basically in chapter 13, which I didn't assign this year, so we didn't read about that. <laughs> but it's Locke's explanation of what a royal prerogative is, is basically that it's... Uh, case where um, the civil law leaves the sovereign free to decide what to do because that's convenient for one reason or another, right? Because it's not well regulated by standing laws or something like that. Um, so uh, it's limited and the sovereign is only authorized to do it for the good of the commonwealth or that the sovereign, not the sovereign, the executive. Um, so, uh, 
The second one, which... Locke does talk about in the reading is the so-called federative power. So the federative power, this is kind of an optimistic name for it. The federative power is the power to conduct foreign policy. Um, Locke says that in principle, this is different from the executive power, which is the power to enforce the laws made by the legislative but that in practice, you would usually want to put them in the same person for various reasons. So, um, so like, I, like I said, it's kind of optimistically called the federative power with the idea that what they'll be doing with this power is making like pacts with other nations, um, you know, entering into confederations with other commonwealths. I'm kind of fuzzy now, aren't I? All right, um, but uh, but of course, uh, a lot of time it's going to be it's going to involve waging war on other commonwealths, um, and right. So as I understand it, in and Locke says that this part, it's a little bit unclear. He says something like. Um, it's not as well regulated by set laws as the internal issues of the Commonwealth. Um, because it, you know, like you're going to have to decide what to do based on the actions of other people who aren't under our laws, who belong to a different Commonwealth. So, or no Commonwealth, I guess. Um, so I guess the idea being that, so to speak, you know, internally to the Commonwealth, although there are these kind of gaps that have to be filled with prerogative, um, you know, like an example, an example of an executive prerogative that we have is pardon in this country, right? Like that's something where the executive is allowed to pardon whoever they want, without giving a reason for it, without any law specifically authorizing it. That's an example of prerogative. Um, so except for a few gaps uh, uh, that are filled by prerogative, that for the most part, the legislative kind of sets up the playing field inside the Commonwealth. And so like it's able to predict, so to speak, in advance what situations will be allowed to arise and provide for them. Whereas when we're dealing with people outside the Commonwealth, um, you know, there's no accounting for what they might do, something like that. Um, it's not clear. He apparently thinks that the uh, there can be some laws regulating this. He doesn't come quite out and say that, but when he says that it's not as well regulated, by, it seems to imply that there could be some laws regulating this, but I, I think it's at least like as a matter of good advice, he's telling the legislative that you're, whoever has the federative power is going to have to be able, allowed to make their own decisions a lot of the time without relying on legal authority. So these are both cases where the executive, I mean, again, assuming that the executive and the federative power are in the same person, where the executive um, is allowed to act without legal authority. Um, um, so, but the reason I put it under this heading is that um, without legal authority means without the authority of the civil law, not without the authority of the law of nature. So I think these are both cases where the executive is um uh by by design of the constitution and the laws of the commonwealth is being uh left some range in which the only thing they have to follow is the laws of nature um but they do have to follow the law of nature um 
And uh, if they don't, they're no longer acting as our representative. So again, he doesn't go into this, but you can imagine like here, I mean, it's again, it seems to be implied, I guess I'll get back to this when I talk about conquest, which is what I'm about to talk about soon. But it seems to be implied that if our executive is going to wage an unjust war, then uh, we have a duty under the law of nature to prevent that. And to punish them for doing it. If, um, if they do it. Um, so even though there can't be, because this is a matter that was left to the decision of the executive, they can't be prosecuted under the law of the Commonwealth. They, they can and must be held accountable to the law of nature. Um, um, and if we don't do that, then we become responsible or at least if we aid them in their unjust war, then we, be, we become personally responsible for the injustice. That, that part he definitely says, and I can only make sense of that if the alternative was that we should have tried to prevent it. Um, okay. Um, As far as the people go, Locke basically discusses three different, well, okay, so there's one that he definitely discusses, which is Resistance to tyranny. Tyranny he defines as when the um, parts of the government, the legislative or the executive, um, overstep the rights that are allowed to them by law in a way that damages um, the subjects. Um, or I guess it could be, again, if there's some laws about foreign policy, it could be in a way that damages uh, people who are not subjects. But anyway, he's not really thinking about that. So it's, um, you know, they go beyond their legal authority in a way that damages the subjects. Um, they use the force of the state for personal ends, for example. Uh, they uh, try to tax without representation. But that, of course, was the big justification for the American Revolution. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but to begin with, and that's why I say this definitely fits in this category, to begin with, in cases like that, and I, I'm, I'm planning to go back and discuss all these things in more detail, but I, so I'm just setting out the framework here. In cases like that, Locke seems to say that at least to begin with, what you have the right to do is to resist the individual unjust acts. Um, so the Commonwealth still exists. You're still under the law of the Commonwealth. So you're still in general required to obey the decisions of the executive duly carried out. But in a case where the justice has miscarried and the executive is um, going outside their bounds, trying to make their own laws, trying to tax without representation, or the legislative um, is, uh, I guess, making unjust laws in some way. In, in any case, you're allowed to resist those individual cases. Um, um, but in addition to that, I think it's, although Locke doesn't always do so, I think it's important to keep track of the distinction between these. There's a right of rebellion that comes in at such a point that the, um, 
the government or part of the government has entered a state of war with the subjects. So at that point, they know there isn't really a commonwealth anymore. Right? This is what Locke, this is a case of what Locke calls dissolution of the commonwealth. There isn't really a commonwealth anymore. There's someone who is uh, unjustly trying to use certain force against the subjects of the commonwealth. So, um, um, so at this point, the law, the right of nature is completely resumed. Right? It's, uh, we're basically back in the state of nature. Um, it's not clear to me exactly, I mean, Locke does discuss this exactly, he gives various criteria. But anyway, like exactly when we cross this line from a government that is the government of a commonwealth but is acting unjustly versus um, a government that by its actions has dissolved the commonwealth. Um, you know, one example he gives is if the executive changes the legislative, takes the legislative out of the hands that we put it in and gives it to someone else. Um, or prevents our legislative from meeting. Another example he gives is um, if the executive delivers the Commonwealth into the hands of a foreign power. Now, like, he's thinking of the Pope in this case. These are all, most of what he says is references to things that actually happened or allegedly happened under James II or Charles I, but especially James II, because I'm not sure if he thinks the original English Civil War was justified or not, but the Glorious Revolution definitely was. So the things that, you know, that would justify this are mostly things that James II was accused of. <laughs> um, um, Okay, and then there's, so this is you know, not exactly a case of retaining the law, the right of nature, but of resuming it. So I don't know, maybe my summary isn't as good as I thought it was. Um, and then there's one other thing that I would put down here, and I'm actually going to discuss this first. Um, which is resistance to the government of a foreigner, of a, con sorry, of a conqueror. Um, it's, I mean, I'm going to discuss this first, I think, because Locke basically ends up saying that this is a case, is really almost like a case of this. That, that at the point where the Commonwealth has been dissolved, it's as if what used to be the government is now an invader. Um, and, but it's easier to understand what he says about an actual invader. So I'm going to talk about them. Also, in some ways, I don't know, more interesting? They're both interesting. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to talk about that first. And this will also, I hope, give me a chance to finally say something about how commonwealths acquire uh, territory, but it's going to have to be just very quick. Um, okay, other questions about any of that before I go into details? Okay. Um. So, conquest. So, what Locke says about conquest, oops, no, that's fuzzy. I can't let that go out. Why does this happen? Oh. 
probably try to get this one to focus again too. But, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, what Locke says about conquest, um, I think, might seem kind of like common sense to us. Um, I think. And therefore, uh, it's important to realize how little that was the case when he wrote it. <laughs> um, so the previous system, the system that um, would have seemed like common sense to most of his readers, I believe, he describes in chapter 16, section 180, Um, this is on page uh, 94 at the top. This I doubt not, but at first sight will seem a strange doctrine, it being so quite contrary to the practice of the world, there being nothing more familiar in speaking of the dominion of countries than to say, such an one conquered it, as if conquest without any more ado conveyed a right of possession. Right, that was the typical assumption. If uh, um, state A fought a war against state B and state B lost, State A got State B's territory, <laughs> and the subjects of State B became subjects of State A. Um, and uh, we know that uh, Hobbes is able to explain that, right? This is a case of commonwealth by acquisition, according to Hobbes, and um, it's... Uh, perfectly correct. There's nothing wrong with it. State A uh, got the subjects of state B into a state, to a state, <laughs> into a situation where state B could no longer protect them. Um, they were in danger of their lives and state A or the sovereign of state A said, um, okay, uh, I could kill you now or if you want, become my subjects. <laughs> And they all in individually made covenants with the sovereign of state A to become subjects of state A. And then the territory, well, as I said, Hobbes never really explains why commonwealths have territory, as far as I know. Um, um, I mean, you might think, since a commonwealth is a covenant between people, that the commonwealth would be exactly where the people are and nowhere else. And if they all moved, the commonwealth would be there. <laughs> Why does it have territory? Um, but in any case, uh, at least that explains why the subjects become subjects of the, conquer the conquering state, and the conquering commonwealth, and I guess somehow is supposed to explain the transfer of territory as well. So, um, I think what's definite, what definitely has changed in this respect is the, uh, what it's familiar to say, uh, it's what actually happens maybe has changed less than that. If it's changed at all, right, uh, some, uh, states continue to gain territory by conquest, I guess, uh, but um, but it's not familiar to say and accept that. Um, whereas for Locke's audience, it was, and so for Locke to say, no, uh, 
that's not a way that a, a commonwealth can acquire territory was surprising. Um, um, I guess I should also say that that change to the extent that it happened, happened more in the 20th century than the 17th, I think. So, um, at least in terms of what was widespread and familiar to say, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, well, it's hard to say. I don't know. I can't quite put myself back into thinking what exactly people thought then. Some people definitely still thought that you could acquire territory by conquering it. A lot of people took that for granted. Um, okay, in any case, um, so I'm not sure whether Locke deserves credit or blame for that change um, or for anything here. I don't, I mean, as you'll see when I talk about this more, you could kind of, not just because of the Constitution of Carolina, but because of the details of his view, you could kind of blame him for getting European colonialism started, although, of course, it had already started before he was there. Uh, but, uh, or you could kind of praise him for getting started the ideas that would delegit delegitimize colonialism. Or you could say that uh, he doesn't really wasn't really because of him either way. I don't know. In any case, um, what what is for sure is that when Locke takes about the talks about this, he pretty much takes down the entire idea of uh, acquiring either uh, rule over people or territory by force. Um, right. That is, he pretty much says there there is no such thing. By right, of course, he knows that it happens, um, but there, it's never lawful. It's always a violation of what law? The law of nature. Obviously, it can't be the violation. We're talking about something that happens between commonwealths, which are always in a state of nature with respect to each other, as Locke and Hobbes both agree. So... Um, it, if it violates the law, it has to be the law of nature. Um, so how does he prove this? Well, I mean, first of all, and in some sense, this takes care of most of the problem right away. He um, deals with the question whether an unjust war could ever um, result in the victor gaining uh, the right to territory. What's going on? Something happened to my cameras. Uh, what's going on? Uh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. But you can't see me. No, I can't see nothing. All right. Right now, my cursor is frozen, so I can't try to fix it. But uh, that was really cool remix. What did you see, actually? Um, you just stayed still, but you're, you kept saying, right away, right away, right away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds like a cool remix. Uh, all right. Uh... uh Okay, so what I was saying, I think, when, as soon as my cursor is moving again, I, oh, here it goes. Now I'll try to get the cameras back. Okay, um, right. So what I was saying was um, that uh, right away he takes care of in a sense, most of the problem by trying to, sh to prove that and in an unjust war, the victor doesn't gain any rights whatsoever. And um, the reason I say this is most of the problem immediately because, you know, uh, most of the history of people 
gaining states gaining territory by conquest is the history of unjust wars, according to Locke. I mean, you know, what is what what is a just war according to Locke? Well, just has to mean that it's you know. Um, allowed by the law of nature. When does the law of nature allow me to harm someone else? Because that's what we're talking about here, right? It is in the, on the international scene, the commonwealths interact with each other as persons, uh, as corporate persons. Right, so like one of them is harming the other one by harming its subjects or its stuff or whatever. And the question is, what could give that right? Um, and the answer is uh, only one thing, punishment. Well, I guess you could say self-defense and punishment. Self-defense is actually a kind of punishment, I guess, according to Locke. Um, You agree with that? I'm not sure. Anyway, they both have the same uh, motive, which is to deter the person from harming me right now and in the future, right? So, um, so a just war has to be for punishment or self-defense. And uh, um, so a just war has to be against an aggressor. So, I mean, whether the war is just depends for Locke on which side you're talking about. Um, there's, right, there's someone who started the war who's the aggressor and their war is unjust. And there's someone else who's trying to defend themselves or trying to punish the aggressor. And it's actually important to realize that, that there could be more just wars than you would first think. Because remember, in the state of nature, I have the right to punish someone for harming someone else. So like if state A attacks state B, state C can enter the war to punish state A. Right. So, um, but uh, in any case, that's the only person who's fighting a just war. Anyone who just says, who starts a war just for the purpose of getting more territory, which obviously includes the history of most empires, right? Uh, you know, Assyrians, Persians, Romans, Incas, whoever, right? Uh, Ottomans, you know, they uh, started wars because they wanted more territory. So that's always would be an unjust war, according to Locke. And he makes, um, he makes it sound, I think, just obvious that uh, this, I mean, look, since the war is unjust, it can't be a just way of obtaining anything. Um, so, uh, oops, this camera is cut out as well. In chapter 16, section 176, um, Right. That the aggressor who puts himself into the state of war with another and unjustly invades another man's right can, by such an unjust war, never come to have a right over the conquered, will be easily agreed by all men, will not think that robbers and pirates have a right of empire over whomsoever they have um, force enough to, sorry, force enough to master or that men are bound by promises which unlawful force extort, exhorts from them. So will all people really agree to this? Well, I mean, 
obviously a lot of people don't agree to it. Uh, well, or maybe they'll claim that they weren't the aggressors. Um, I have a question, Professor. Yes. Is this um, this inability for them to have a right over the conquered have to do with the need for consent in order for a commonwealth to be? Well, uh, I mean, uh, it's more like this is why there's a need for consent, I think, right? There's a need for consent because uh, I can't acquire, I can't by force acquire a right to something that belongs to someone else. So how could I? Only by their consent. Um, so I think this is actually more fundamental, but I'm not sure. Maybe you could obviously say it either way. Um, why do I think that's the right way to say it? In the state of nature. Right. So the law of nature in this case is negative. It tells me not to invade someone else's property, including their life, liberty, and possessions. Um, so, I mean, that's the fundamental issue here. The, the, that's the artificial chain that's restraining me. Um, you know, then as a byproduct of that, if I do want to gain, to, to uh, change who has a right to what, I can only do it by their consent. Uh, okay, I mean, this is kind of a, I'm not sure if it makes that much difference, but since I'm a philosopher, I discuss questions that don't make any difference. <laughs> it, may, it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sure if that's accurate. Yes. Question. Yes. Um, so, are you saying that a just war and unjust war is going to change depending on the circumstance? Like, if it's for punishment, then the person who's punishing the other commonwealth would be in the just position and the person um, like fighting back would be in an unjust war. Yes. Which that doesn't make too much sense though because of what we said about um, the right to um, oh, the right to retain your right to self-preservation. Hmm, I see what you're saying. So I think yeah, what does Locke think about Suppose you're in the state of nature and you did something unjust and now everyone wants to punish you. And in trying to defend yourself, you harm all those people who are trying to punish you. Um, I don't know if he talks about this, and yet he has to. See, like Hobbes doesn't have to talk about this, right? I mean, because for Hobbes, like once I'm in that position of having to defend myself against, and for Hobbes, this has to be in a civil state, otherwise it can't be punishment, right? So like 
I've been sentenced to death by the sovereign, and now they're taking me out to kill me, and I, like, kill all the guards and run away. So, um, um, so if you ask, well, um, like, if I had a right to do that, why can the state then try to recapture me and punish me even worse or whatever? Um, but that's okay for Hobbes, because for Hobbes at that point, I'm in a state of nature with the Commonwealth again. And a state of nature is a state of war of all against all. So I have the right to defend myself by whatever means I choose, but they have the right to defend themselves against me by whatever means they choose, right? So the, the question of, like, whether they have the authority, like, like you know, whether they can claim that my damage against them was unjust just doesn't come up. But according to Locke, I would think it does. Um, and obviously he doesn't want to say that, you know, when everyone's trying to punish you and you kill them instead, um, you're not responsible for that because it was your right to self-defense. So he must understand the right to self-defense differently than Hobbes does, but... Yeah, I have to admit that at the moment, I don't... I'm sure if I think about it more... But at the moment, I'm not sure what he says about it. So that's a good question. And that's not very satisfactory. It's <laughs> okay. Um, okay, yeah, obviously... For the same reason Hobbes does, he can't say that I have no right to, well, at least not according to the second treatise view, maybe according to the essay view where I'm worried about punishment in the afterlife or whatever, but according to the second treatise picture, like, he can't say that I have a duty to lay my head down and let it be chopped off. Because, you know, that would just as much for Hobbes, for him as for Hobbes, have to mean that I expect more pleasure from having my head chopped off than not. And that can't be true, right? So, like, in the end, I always act in my own interest. So it would be vain for there to be a law saying that I have to do that. But on the other hand, yeah, obviously he has to have some way of explaining why um, could it possibly have something to do with like a sovereign who's or an executive being punished recruiting his subjects to fight in this war where they're not the ones being punished yeah I mean he doesn't unfortunately he doesn't get into that issue at all like, like when the subjects who are fighting were forced to fight in some sense. And does that make them not responsible? He just doesn't discuss that. Even though it seems like a really likely scenario, basically. <laughs> uh, that, you know, they had to choose between fighting in this unjust war and being killed themselves. Uh, so even though they're combatants, uh, well, it might seem that not only don't we have a right to take them prisoner after the war is over, but you don't even have a right to kill them during the war, <laughs> which would be a problem. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, unless, of course, unless you're heading for an absolute pacifist position, but Locke obviously is not. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'll think about that more. Maybe I'll, something will come to me. But um, I want to get on with talking about the things that I do understand, or that at least I think I understand. So, um, so I was going to say one more thing about this, which is that um, uh, Hobbes actually is one of the people who agrees that you can't get title to anything through an unjust war. I mean, he agrees kind of vacuously because he doesn't think there can be an unjust war, <laughs> right? According to Hobbes, every war is just. 
because all commonwealths are in the state of nature, and the state of nature is a war of all against all. So uh, you're always attacking someone who's already at war with you. There is no first aggressor. Um, uh, so as as usual, like um, Locke is probably disagreeing with some other people. In this case, not Filmer. I'm not sure who about like the issue he's actually talking towards, but his disagreement with Hobbes is really just about this one thing, whether the state of nature is really a war of all against all, something like that. In any case, um, um, so he takes it as obvious and something that should be agreed on by everyone that if you're the aggressor, you don't get any rights out of winning. Um, Um, and as I said, in some sense, that takes care of most of the issue, but, um, you know, partly because I think given that commonwealths are in a state of nature, this, I think, is part of what maybe the main thing that Locke thinks is inconvenient about a state of nature, generally speaking, um, is that, um, um, Everyone is entitled to their own opinion about what the law of nature states and about what cases it applies to. So the, each commonwealth is going to say, um, well, we think the law of nature is X, Y, Z. And uh, moreover, we think that this is a case where this other commonwealth has violated the law of nature. Right? And, you know, that's called finding a pretext for a war, and it's not hard. <laughs> So I think mostly for that reason, Locke actually spends a lot of effort trying to show that even in a just war, victory doesn't give you any title to the territory and only a kind of very limited title to the persons of the, pers of the commonwealth you're fighting against. So... Um, Counselor? Yes. So you said that if you're the aggressor, you don't get any rights from winning. So what? What is? What like? What do you get? Well, you get a lot of stuff. You just don't get any right to it. It's just like what do you get from robbing? You don't get any rights to the stuff you stole, but you have it, <laughs> right? So I mean, so again, Locke understands that, and he mentions this. He over and over, basically, that, yeah, of course, it's true at the time that one commonwealth has defeated another, whether justly or unjustly, the people in the defeated commonwealth are in no position to complain, and the victors can say, we get the right to all your stuff, right? And and Hobbes is right in the sense that the, the vanquished are going to say, uh, uh, you know, oh yeah, how come? And the victor is going to say, well, uh, it's either that or I kill you. <laughs> and the vanquished are going to say, oh, okay, take our stuff, right? So, like, I mean, yeah, the winner gets something, but they don't get the right to it. Now, I mean, what exactly that means, according to Locke, I think would um, require, like some kind of careful investigation, again, in terms of, like, who do we, who's the executive who's going to enforce this right in the long term? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to call it a right. Um, okay, now there's some questions here about what would be the point of being of defending yourself if you don't get anything. It means, sorry, it means that you don't get anything that originally belonged to the aggressor, right? So like, here's Commonwealth A, and here's Commonwealth B. So Commonwealth B invades Commonwealth A. So Commonwealth B is the aggressor. 
Commonwealth B is an unjust war. And Commonwealth A's war against B is a just war. Now, I mean, in some cases, A might be able to win the war just by, like, driving B out. But in many cases, that won't be enough, right? Like, uh, you know, if B still has their armies all here waiting to come back in as soon as I turn my back, then obviously I haven't really won this war until I enter B's territory and subdue B, right? So now this was a just war. A was allowed to do that to B because it's self-defense and punishment also, right? B has to be not only prevented from harming A now, but also deterred from harming A in the future. So, um, so A has every right to enter B's territory at this point, and like, uh, um, you know, defeat B's army, which will mean killing people, and probably will mean damaging lots of stuff along the way too. Um, so that's just. But the question is now, when all now all the dust settles, A is left, you know. Um, in control of part of B's ter former territory. Does A get territory? Does A get that territory because it was a just war? That's the question. And the answer is no. A has to go back to the former state. B still owns this territory. And even if B is completely dissolved by the attack, so there is no more commonwealth here, right? That is A's uh, um, counterattack was so powerful that B's institutions are smashed. There is no more legislative or executive. There's just a bunch of individuals, basically. Nevertheless, Locke says, um, A has to retreat and let those individuals form a new commonwealth for themselves. Um, so does that answer the questions about what the point of, so the, the point of self-defense for A was to maintain all the stuff that was A is to belong, to begin with. But, um, but uh, that's what A gets out of winning the war. And similarly, if it's C that, that comes in and like attacks B in order to protect A, it's, it's, it's the same story. C may have to do all kinds of stuff to B, but at the end, C gets no right to B's territory. Um, okay. Now, again, if the question is, what's, what is the point to uh, an unjust war? The answer is, um, well... Uh, Insofar as you expect the law of nature to be enforced, there is no point. So if you're reasonable, you shouldn't. Although, again, I was asking, so who's the executive in this case? I mean, the executive here is perhaps these surrounding countries, but if B is big enough, then that might not seem relevant. Um, especially, like, if B has a nuclear deterrent. Of course, Locke didn't have to worry about that, right? Like, if B has the magic thing that, such that no one is going to want to invade them, <laughs> then who's the executive? Um, all right, but in any case, so yeah, so that's the idea. And so how does he argue for this, though? So because, after all, he does admit that um, the aggressor has forfeited their rights by, by starting this unjust war. They've forfeited, in principle, all their property. That is life, liberty, and possessions. Um, so that the just side will get absolute dominion over them if they win. Um, and uh, I guess I never got to talking about this explicitly, but this, according to Locke, is the only way that slavery can 
legitimately arise. Um, I guess it could be internally also as a result of a criminal having forfeited their right to life, liberty, and property, right? That has put themselves in a state of war with everyone else. Um, slavery can only arise as a kind of, uh, lawfully as a kind of delayed death sentence, right? That is, so once A wins the war, and now um, finds themselves not only like in possession of part of B's territory, but with lots of B's, you know, soldiers under their control. So uh, each one of them has forfeited their, their life by participating in this unjust war. Again, as I said, he doesn't raise the issue, wait, what if they were forced to participate? It seems like an obvious question, but he doesn't raise it. But in any case, um, um, so, uh, so we're regarding each one of these people individually as responsible. I mean, um, and of course, the members of the government who ordered the war and whatever are all responsible. They've all forfeited their lives. Now they're under A's power. So A can say, okay, instead of killing you, I'm going to deprive you of your liberty and tell you to work for me. And that's the way slavery can legitimately arise. Um, this actually is the very exception that was included in the, is it the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery? I always forget which amendment it is. Right, but it says, you know, I don't remember the language either, but it says basically there should be no slavery or, um, or um, enforced servitude or whatever the other alternative is there, except as a punishment, um, you know, and it mentions due process or something, I don't remember, but, Right, so I mean, this is the very exception that we actually still have in this country. I've, not that it's not controversial; uh, it's very controversial, but we have it. Right, that is, you prison labor is basically a constitutional form of slavery. Um, right, so the only kind of slavery that Locke allows is the kind we actually still have, <laughs> um, according to his official position. Um, oh, I, so Samantha says, I thought the subjects of the previous Commonwealth would be left to create a new one. Well, I mean, that is, except for the ones who have forfeited their lives. So I'm getting to that. But I mean, this, this, the fact that he concedes this, it's true, seems to mean that the conqueror must have acquired title to everything. Tamara, or oh, are you re asking a question, or are you just doing that? Oh no, I apologize. I was oh, okay. I was, no, that's fine. I was just confused. All right. Um, um, right. So you might you might think, well, look, you know, A has absolute power over the subjects of B. Doesn't that mean that A has? Um, uh, gained complete control over the Commonwealth B, and now uh, there is no Commonwealth B. It's part of A. So, um, so first of all, I mean, Locke says, well, this is not political dominion. It's despotical dominion. Right. This is part of his disagreement with Hobbes, whether um, what Hobbes calls servants, or what Locke calls slaves, that is, people who aren't actually in chains, but who are um, 
required to work for a master because at some point the master, they covenanted for their life and gave up all their liberty to the master, right? So um, according to Hobbes, sovereignty is despotical dominion when there's enough servants that it forms a commonwealth. <laughs> According to Locke, they're two completely different things. The despotical dominion can only be over someone who has forfeited all their rights, whereas political dominion is something that people gave you by exercising their rights. Um, so, uh, um, there's no overlap between them at all, according to Locke. Um, now, uh, you might think, well, that's kind of a technicality, isn't it, Locke? I mean, who cares whether it's political dominion or despotical dominion? Well, I mean, it does mean uh, that, according to Locke, um, um, For example, they can escape if they if, if they can escape, they have the right to. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty clear, even in this situation, right? That is the fact that they promised to work instead of be killed, which for Hobbes is a valid covenant, for Locke is not. Again, this is related to the question that Samantha asked earlier, but this is a lawful punishment. Nevertheless, Locke agrees with Hobbes, they have the right to defend their own liberty, if they can. Um, so it's not really, uh, it's, you know, it's a dominion that's maintained by force, not by law. So it's not really political dominion at all. Um, these people don't have a duty to obey, A. They're just forced to. <laughs> the, 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 the only thing that makes it different from being just like grabbed off the street and forced to work is that A hasn't violated the law of nature in forcing them. But as far as they go, uh, they're just being forced to do something. And if they can defend themselves, then they have a right to, I think. Um, but I guess so... Um, Um, but I guess more importantly, um, this despotical dominion, um, although it's absolute, unlike what Locke calls political power, which is always limited by law and right, although it's absolute, and in that sense is in some, some way much more than political power, um, it's also, um, paradoxically, much more limited than political power. Why is it limited? Well, um, well, here's the limits as Locke states, states them. This is in chapter 16, section 178. Um, he has an absolute power over the lives of those who by an unjust war have forfeited them, but not over the lives of, or fortunes of those who engaged not in the war, nor over the possessions even of those who were actually engaged in it. So, um, right, so this gives, no rights over non-combatants. And what's probably, probably more surprising, No right to possessions. So, 
Um, 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 now, as far as the first thing goes, right? So, I mean, in a sense, this is obvious. They, how did they forfeit their lives? By engaging in an unjust war. Now, I mean, you might say, well, but the whole Commonwealth engaged in the war via their authorized representatives. So they're all responsible. Oh, can you repeat what it says? Yeah, this says despotical dominion. This says limited. This says no rights over non-combatants. And this says no right to possessions. Although I think it's about possessions more, but I'm not sure. All right. Um, um, see, if your writing is illegible enough, you can't. it doesn't matter if you can spell it. <laughs> right. right. um, so, uh, uh, sorry, what was I saying? Right, so you might think, well, the whole Commonwealth did it. So they're all responsible. But to that, Locke says, um, they never gave their representatives the right to violate the law of nature. Why didn't they? They couldn't, because they didn't have the right to violate the law of nature. <laughs> so, um, so in other words, if... Um, um, you suppose even that we have a, a commonwealth that's a perfect democracy. So we all take a vote and the majority says to go to war. Um, that first stage when the commonwealth was formed, where everyone agreed that um, the whole assembly of the people would be the legislative, um, what we did was cede to the whole assembly of the people our individual right of punishing according to the law of nature. We didn't cede to them the right to unjustly harm other people. Because we didn't have that right, so we couldn't cede it to anyone. So, um, so the people who voted against the war are not responsible in that case, according to Locke. Um, right, because that was an illegal action of the assembly of the people. Um, as opposed to a legal action of the assembly of the people, which the, peop which the minority are bound to respect because of the original compact they made unanimously with everyone else. Right, so, um, um, so therefore the non-combatants can't be held responsible just because their representatives did this. It's a little bit less clear why they can't, you know, they're, and, and by the way, so Locke, at least most of the time, seems to assume that non-combatants include all the women. So uh, that means that a, you know, a pretty good proportion of the population has, has not forfeited their rights automatically. Um, whether that's so clear uh, that, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily the case that the only way to participate, I mean, leaving aside the question of, you know, can't women also uh, enter into battle, which we know they can, but I'm just saying, like, supposing that they don't, that none of them do, does that really mean none of them aided in the prosecution of the war? Presumably not. There's other ways besides actually fighting. I don't, again, he doesn't go into that issue. He, so, but, um, but, uh, um, Anyway, what's certainly not included here, and this is um, going to be probably the most important point in his whole argument, is children who have not reached the age where they have the use of reason. That is, who are not yet subjects to the, to the law of nature. They can't be responsible for this. Even if they actually fought, they're not responsible. Um, 
So, uh, so therefore, what Samantha was asking before, wait, I thought you said the citizens of B or the subjects of B had to be allowed to form their own new commonwealth. What that means is the ones that B has not gotten any dominion over because they're not combatants. And that includes at least the, the coming generations, right? I mean, obviously, it doesn't include the children who are alive now. Obviously, even less does it include children who are going to be born in the future, who, of course, are not responsible for this, right? So, um, um, you know, I mean, Locke's disagreement about Hobbes about the, with Hobbes about the nature of paternal authority is important here. According to Hobbes, you know, the um, father still retains the right of dominion over the children. If the commonwealth is dissolved or if the family is deprived of the commonwealth's uh, um, defense, then... Uh, the father like resumes that despotical role in the family. And um, then if the father is, you know, forced to surrender, the father will surrender the children as well. <laughs> um, but according to Locke, of course, the father and mother have no authority like that over the children. Um, so, uh, right, they can't make an agreement to permanently deprive the children of the, their liberty because that's not part of paternal authority. Um, so, uh, right, so at least the children who are alive now and all the coming generations are not included in this despotical dominion at all. This, by the way, shows that, uh, again, there's nothing in Locke's position that could conceivably justify hereditary slavery. Even though in the Constitution of Carolina, he does seem to justify that. I mean, he doesn't say very much about slavery. He, but uh, uh, as I might have mentioned, the Constitutions of Carolina basically set up a kind of feudal system for the, for the new colony, including serfs. <laughs> including hereditary serfdom. So in the constitutions of Carolina, you know, that kind of thing is possible. But according to Locke's principles, as expressed later in the second treatise, it's not conceivable that there could be a justification for that. All right. So anyway, I mean, in a sense, that's the uh, easier part. Um, um, It's this part that might seem harder to understand. Why does the why does A get no right to these people's possessions? After all, they've forfeited all their rights. Right? I mean, if they forfeited the light, right to their life, they, you know, uh, a fortiori, as we say, they, they certainly have forfeited their right to liberty and possessions. So, um, so Locke actually has a really quick answer to that. Um, it's true that these people have lost the right to their possessions, but that doesn't make their possessions belong to A. That just means they don't belong to those people anymore. Who do they belong to? And the answer is, um, well, it's as if these people had died. I mean, I'm, you know, Locke doesn't say this in so many words, but I think that's how to understand what he's saying about it. It's as if these people have died, right? They have no property left in their life. Um, therefore, they can't own any other property. So who, gets, who does the property belong to now? Well, all other things being equal, it belongs to their heirs. And we know that at least uh, some of their heirs uh, now actually alive are non-combatants. 
And we know furthermore that their future heirs who will be born later definitely are non-combatants. So these people's property now belongs to those innocent heirs, not to A. Um, so that's the short answer to the, to the question. So that's why, even though A gets the right to make these people, in, these people, I, I should remind you, are the people who actually fought in the war against, the unjust war against A. A gets the right to enslave them, um, but A doesn't get the right to, like, take one item from their house. I guess A doesn't even get the right to their uniforms or, you know, whatever. Those belong to their heirs. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and therefore, much less so does A get right to their property. Their, their, sorry, to their real property, that is their land. Um, now, at this point, we're assuming that Acquiring territory equals acquiring property. Real, like real property, that is land. Um, this is where the fact that it's unclear how commonwealths get to territory becomes kind of a problem. Well, but I see I really shouldn't get into this because I haven't talked about the right to resistance or rebellion or anything. Um, before you continue, I'm still having trouble understanding what you mean, like when the see, when the Commonwealth who like conquers another one has a right to something because you said, well, we're, we're kind of going over this now, but you said that they don't have a right to the possessions or the people in that territory. So what gives them the right to combatants versus non-combatants? Because these are the people who actually are uh, in a state of war with them. I mean, basically, and Locke says this in so many words, slavery is a continuation of the state of war. It's uh, like, I'm still, ex I'm still exercising my right by the law of nature to defend and punish. Um, it's just like, instead of doing it by killing them, which I would have a right to, I decide instead to allow them to stay alive, but make them do stuff for me. Does that answer your question? Or are you still, is it still not clear? Yeah, that, that makes more okay. sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, but that's why it's really strictly limited to the people who actually, under the law of nature, I have a right to restrain and punish. Um, um, okay, what I fear I don't really have time to get into. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll just say, so first of all, like, you know, when Locke does address the way commonwealths get territory, the closest I can see to the way he explains it is that all the people who form the commonwealth, or some of them anyway, come in with real property, and that part of their agreement is that this is that this real property is going to be territory of the commonwealth. Now, what does it mean that it's territory of the commonwealth? Because it doesn't mean that the government of the commonwealth now has that property right. On the contrary, they can't take it away from me without representation. I retain my property right from the law, of, from the state of nature. But it means something like um, the law can attach conditions to the possession of that property. And the law will attach the condition that in order to possess that property, you have to be subject to this commonwealth. Um, so that's why, that's how Locke thinks that the Commonwealth gets passed down to the next generation. He says, the children are free not to become subjects of the Commonwealth when they reach the age of reason. Why do they usually 
remain subjects of the Commonwealth? Well, usually they want to inherit their parents' property. And the condition of being subject to this Commonwealth is attached to possession of that property. And so by remaining, taking possession of it, they give their tacit consent to the Commonwealth. Okay, again, this is something I should talk about at much greater length, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that um, how the Commonwealth gets more territory than that is super unclear. But it does, obviously, according to Locke, right? Locke says, I give my tacit consent to obey the laws of the Commonwealth just by freely walking along a highway in its territory. Presumably, I mean, maybe the highway was once someone's property and they gave it up for public use, but presumably, no, it was never anyone's property. And yet it becomes part of the territory of the commonwealth. Um, it seems that Locke thinks that commonwealths get this territory by virtue of a pact between all the commonwealths in, an, in a region where they, he says this explicitly at some point, you know, they agree to each stay within their own limits. And this is one reason I think that, that if you look carefully, you'll see that Locke has left a hole for a certain kind of uh, colonialism, a certain kind of settler colonialism. Um, if, you know, if you find that the people in some region have very little real property, or none at all, because they're nomads, or, you know, they're hunter-gatherers, whatever. Um, but if you find they have very little real property that they're actually using, so it's their property under the law of nature, um, and the rest of it is waste. And there's never been any contact between this, their commonwealth and yours before, so there's no pact between you. Then it seems that you can go into this waste territory and say, well, I'm leaving you guys enough <laughs> and take it over. It seems like Locke is prepared to um, justify that. Of course, he's not justifying at all what actually happens, which is that you take over this part too and you kill all those people <laughs> or make them slaves or at least uh, make them your subjects in the best case scenario, right? He's not justifying that, but uh, it's easy to understand why it's like pretty hard to keep commonwealths to doing this and not doing that, even assuming this were okay. Um, okay, um, there's a lot of other stuff to talk about here, but the main thing I want to talk about, which will segue into the next part, I guess, is, um, I mean, I haven't gone into the whole issue of reparations, which Locke discusses at length, um, I haven't gone into the issue of military op, uh, occupation, which Locke doesn't discuss, but which is a serious issue, right? Like, does A have to withdraw immediately? That seems like it's a bad idea. Right? We can't require A to withdraw immediately, because that will either leave a chaos beyond A's body, A's borders, or will lead to B rearming and invading again. So, I mean, A has to be able to stay there for a while and get things settled, right? But then, of course, we know how dangerous that is. Um, so Locke doesn't touch on that issue of military occupation. Um, and he also doesn't... Well, let me talk about this after I mention the main thing I do want to get to, which is that... Um, so, okay... Locke says, A doesn't have a right to any of B's territory. For that matter, if B won, even more obviously, because B was, that was an unjust war, B has no right to any of A's territory. But Locke knows the way things go, uh, a 
of course, the people in this territory have, will have no choice, right? If the other side really won, convincingly enough, they'll have no choice but to accept, um, you know, the conqueror as their new uh, government. So it might seem like it's in vain to, to say that the conqueror has no right to this territory. The conqueror is going to take it. That's the end of the story. But that's why Locke says, ah, it's not the end of the story. The children and the children's children and the children's children, children of these people always have a right to kick out the conqueror. Right? Because there never was a just acquisition of this territory to begin with. So the whole time this government is there, it's illegitimate. There is no legal government. And any time the descendants of the B people find that they're strong enough to throw out A, they have every right to do that. And this, at least, you know, is part, I guess, of the executive that's supposed to make A think twice about staying there. Right, that eventually we may be punished for it. Um, now, um, this raises a lot of hairy problems that, again, Locke doesn't go into. Like, I mean, here's a kind of thing that happens pretty often. So, um, B, to keep it simple, let's just assume this is unjust. B invades A and takes over A's territory. Then B lets some people, well, either from within B or from outside, come into this territory peacefully. So these people never fought an unjust war against A. They came in under the B government. The B government was illegitimate, but the B government was in control and, you know, keeping the peace. And they came in legitimately. They bought property, whatever. Um, now, suppose later A wants to, or A's descendants wants to rise up and kick B out. So, like, call these people C. Suppose they're immigrants. They come from somewhere else. Now there's C all over here. Are C people and their descendants, especially their descendants, are they combatants? That doesn't seem right. So, but the A people, if there's enough C, the A people may be completely unable to reestablish their commonwealth without kicking the C out by force, right? So in other words, Suppose you were the owner of an island called Manhattan and uh, some people, well, it was actually got by fraud, right? But then it was maintained by force, as Locke says. So some people came and took your territory away from you. And uh, then over the next few hundred years, they let millions of immigrants settle on your former territory. And meanwhile, there's still only a few of you. Now what right do you have? Locke doesn't go into that, but like a lot of the insoluble, seemingly insoluble situations like this in the world are, you know, involve complicated stories like that, not the simple stories that Locke tells. Um, okay, I spent too long on that because this is so interesting and I didn't talk about the right of rebellion. But maybe, in a way, the right of rebellion is much simpler. Um, he says, um, usurpation, which is the case where the former government is displaced by a new illegitimate government, is really the domestic equivalent of conquest. This is, uh, should I show this inside the book? No, maybe I'll just read it because I'm running out of time. 
Um, but this is chapter 17, uh, section 197. As conquest may be called a foreign usurpation, so usurpation is a kind of domestic conquest. With this difference, that an usurper can never have right on his side, it being no usurpation, but where one has got into the possession of what another has right to. Right? So there's no such thing as a just usurpation. This is, I guess, just by definition of usurpation. Right? So, I mean, it's not really an interesting point. So the main point is that the, um, the government that manages to take control by force without the consent of the people um, might as well be a foreign invader. Um, they have no right to make laws. They have no right to... Um, decide property disputes, to inflict punishments, any of that stuff. Um, so even if they act justly, after their usurpation, they still don't get any of those rights. Unless, unless it comes to the point where the people are allowed to freely give their consent, and they do. That, that's also an exception in this case, too, right? Like if B, you know, after, forget C now, if B, after conquering A, like, you know, stands down their troops and brings in international observers and whatever and holds a free election, and the people of A say, hey, we like B, we want to be citizens of B, that at that case, of course, that would be fine. But that's, you know... Um, that just means the invasion is over and has been replaced by something else. Same with usurpation. But short of that, the usurping government never gets any of these rights, no matter what they do. Um, that's how it's different from the other case, which I erased, but of tyranny, where it's the, it's the legitimate government that does have some rights, is now overstepping them. Um, but so in any case, in this case of usurpation, Locke says, so therefore, again, there's a perpetual right to rebel. No matter how long ago this happened. And it could be, so this is a case of, us this even is the usual case of usurpation. Suppose our commonwealth is a monarchy. And... Uh, it's all Suppose our commonwealth is a monarchy and we have a certain, like, uh, dynasty here, right? So at the time we formed the uh, commonwealth, we um, at least gave at least part of the governing power, at least the executive or whatever, to some person and their heirs. And of course, we had to establish laws that would say who counts as their heir and so forth. Now, suppose someone else who isn't a rightful heir. Normally, this would be someone who still belongs to this family that isn't the next in line, or it could be someone else from outside. Anyway, comes in here, cuts off this line, and makes themselves king. This is usurpation. So none of these kings are legitimate. So if there ever comes a time, like obviously when it first happened, B1 managed to get enough of the army on their side or whatever that people couldn't resist. But if there ever comes a time in the future when the people find they can resist, then they have the right to cast off the line of B and bring back A or establish a new form of government. I see him out of time. So... Uh, I guess all I'll say about this is like both of these rights to perpetual, perpetual rights to rebellion seem like they could be a cause of a lot of trouble. Um, and that sometimes the other way of looking at things might be better, which Locke recognizes that you might say that. And he has arguments against it. Uh, but anyway, I don't have time to say more about that. So, uh,
I'll see you on Thursday when we talk about Rousseau. <laughs> okay, bye.